Good morning. As we gather on this Valentine's Day, what an appropriate place to be in a house of love on Valentine's Day. In fact, have you heard this, the origination of Valentine's? Kelly told it this morning, and I thought, that is so cool. But evidently, Valentinus was a person um, in the, um, during the 200s, and he was a clergy person, and he through what he was doing was boldly going against the Roman Empire and what they were wanting at that time period. And so as he was boldly proclaiming the love of God, um, he was connected with the judge who was condemning him, but he challenged the judge. And through that challenge on what he thought God was telling him to do, the judge's daughter was saved. And then the judge released all the, the Christian prisoners because of their faith that he was housing but then eventually Claudius, the Roman emperor, was so upset by the message that Valentinus was preaching that he had him executed on February 14th. So as we look at Valentine's Day, um, please remember back to um, this person who gave his life because of sharing the love of God with others. So as we look at the ultimate love and who Jesus is, prepare your hearts this morning for who God is calling you to be as we look at Jesus being the author of our faith. And I want to challenge this morning to look really deeply whose side are we leaning on? Are we trusting in the faith of Jesus Christ? Are we leaning on our own understanding? Or maybe even a faith that we've just made up in our own mind. So that's our challenge this morning. As we also begin this morning, we want to open up to um, the prayers of the people. And what is on your heart this morning that you would want to share anything uh, about concerning? Grover will run around with a microphone if you have anything to share this morning. Is anyone? I'll mention, please be in prayer for um, Sherry Lee and family. Her mom passed this week. So I remember her in prayer and the funeral will be next week. But I'd very much appreciate our prayers. Um, I just want to lift up the Kennett family. Uh, they lost their son, who was 14. He was a student of Shaw, and I was very blessed to be his teacher last year. So um, please be in prayer for that whole family. Anyone else this morning? Also pray for the, the apparently big snows coming this week, so we pray for that. If anyone at home or anyone here has any issues that you need, call the church and we'll do what we can to, to help you out with that. Let's pray. God, as we recognize the incredible, incredible love that you displayed for us by giving your life for us, thank you for opening this doorway that as we surrender fully to you, that you open up a life that is eternal for us. God, help us to be able to communicate this clearly and effectively with those around us and help us this morning as we boldly look to you as a source of all hope. In Jesus' precious name we pray, amen. Well, good morning and happy Valentine's Day to everyone. Let's all stand. Casting my cares aside, I'm leaving my past behind. I'm setting my heart and mind on you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing there's so much more. Knowing that all you have in store for me is good. Today is a day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. Today is a day you have made. I will rejoice and be glad in it. And I won't worry about tomorrow. I'm trusting in what you say. Today is a day. Putting my fears aside, I'm 
I'm leaving my doubts behind. I'm giving my hopes and dreams to you, Jesus. I'm reaching my hands to yours, believing there's so much more, knowing that all you have in store for me is good. Oh, it's good. Today is a day. and sorrows where you lead me i will follow i'm trusting in what you say today is a day today is a day today is a day amen let's give the lord some praise this morning can separate even if I run away your love never fails I know I still make mistakes but you have new mercies for me every day your love never fails far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side but your love never fails you stay the same through the ages your love never changes there may be pain in the night but joy comes in the morning
And you make all things work together for my good. Yes, you make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. You make all things work together for my good. Oh, you stay the same. Joy comes in the morning, and when the oceans rage, I don't have to be afraid, because I know that you love me, your love never Spirit alive in me, this life to declare your promise, my soul now to stay. Sing it out now. So I'll stand with arms high and heart abandoned in awe of the one who gave it all. I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrender all I am is yours. So I'll stand with arms high. Time. I'll 
heart, oh God, completely to you. So what can I say? And what can I do? But offer this heart, oh Father, we love you so much, and uh, we're just so blessed to, to have this assurance of faith, Lord, that you have done what we could never do. And in light of that, Lord, we, uh, just like this song says, when the question comes, what can we do, offer our lives. That's what you want, Lord. You don't want our perfection. You want our heart. And I pray, Lord, that that is what we understand over the course of our lifetime as much as we strive to please you. And we should. We should strive to please you. But if our heart's not in it, Lord, then it's meaningless to you. So may our hearts be tender and humble and thankful for all that you have done for us, Lord. And Lord, as we have a a time of offering, I pray, Father, that... uh, that you would bless what we give. And I pray that as we give, our hearts would be grateful and humble. Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you for all that you've done. We ask it all in Jesus' name. Amen. As the uh, children are being dismissed, we're going to sing a song. It's called The Change in Me. It's about the work of the Holy Spirit. And... uh, We have sung it once or twice maybe before, and you're welcome to sing along. But I love the lyrics to this song because for the first time in in many years of supposedly following Christ, really for the first time in just the past two or three years, have I seen this change in my own life. And I know that it is the direct result of just the time that I spend with the Lord and the work of the Holy Spirit as he... This perspective has changed. The desire of the things of the flesh become less and less, and the desire of the things of God and his word become more and more. And the more time we spend at the feet of Christ and the more time that we spend in his word, the the more we're going to see the pendulum kind of shift in the other direction. My prayer for all of us is that as as we go through our walk with Christ, um, okay, I'm going to pause because my wife is struggling right now. We're going to go into prayer. It's a good time to go into prayer. We're going to lift up Kelly right now. Um, You guys know that she has some health issues that sometimes um, cause this and weather issues and things like that. And so, Lord, we just lift Kelly up to, to you right now, Father God. We lift up Kelly, and we ask for your strength and your peace and your comfort, Lord. We pray over Eric and and their whole family, Lord, that you will grant wisdom and and strength and power for them to, to get through each and every day. Lord, you are so faithful, and we are so thankful. Because when we come to this day, Valentine's Day, Lord, and it brings a lot of sadness for some. But when we think about your love, and your ability to love us, even when we don't deserve it. Lord, it should make us just want to shout for joy and to share that love with those around us. And that's what the world needs, Lord. They don't need Valentine's Day 
chocolates and flowers and the things of the world, Lord. They need love, genuine, unconditional love. And that's what you've given us. And that's what you continue to give us every time we fall down, every time we fail, every time we turn our back on you, you chase after us and you pursue us and you love us and you never give up on us. So Lord, I'm asking right now that you empower each and every one of us by your spirit to not give up on this world, to not watch the news and then shut down, to close ourselves up in our homes and not reach out to those around us, but instead, Father God, that we will love them unconditionally, that we will pursue them, Lord Jesus, in the name, in your name, in the Lord, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that we will pursue them, Father God, like you pursue us so that they, we can proclaim your name and they can experience your love and your joy. Father, I lift up Kelly to you right now because not only do you love us that much, Lord, that you offer us unconditional love, but you're also the great healer. You're also compassionate and giving. And Father God, we just lift that family up to you and we lift up our world to you, Lord that when we seek, we will find, that when we knock, you will open, and that you will not stop pursuing us. And so in turn, Lord, we give you our lives and we will not stop pursuing you and following you, trusting you and loving you. Father, we lift these things up in the name of Jesus and we come with hearts of thanksgiving. Lord, bring your spirit upon this place do not leave us the same. Change us. You be the change in us that the world cannot deny, that the world can see, and that the world will want. We love you, and we praise you, and we give you glory. In Jesus' holy and precious name, amen. Kelly did a sermon a couple years ago, um, and the message was on water, if you remember. She used um, John 4 as the passage of looking at the living water. But as part of that message, she talked about that she has something called POTS, which is um, postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, which means sometimes the blood... Um, is more in the legs than in the brain, and so then it causes her to faint. So please, and also it led to chronic fatigue with her in the past. So thank you, Debbie, for leading us in prayer, and we'll continue praying for Kelly as um, she is dealing with her um, episode right now, and for care, for Eric and the rest of the family. As we um, continue worshiping this morning, it's so important to recognize that whatever is going on in our life and whatever we have to, to deal with, that we have an incredibly loving, caring Jesus to turn to. And that no matter what is um, in front of us that we have to face. And I'm so um, inspired by Kelly as she has always put Jesus first and has been the ultimate source of her strength and hope um, through whatever medical stuff she, that she has had to deal with. So, we're praying for you, Kelly. As we continue to, to worship this morning and remembering Kelly as we do so, I want to talk a little bit about who do we lean on for our source of, of strength and, and hope for things. And things do come up in our way, and things happen in our lives that are surprises, and things that we're not wanting, anticipating, how do we deal with that? When I was in church camp 
years, a few years ago. But as a teenager in church camp, we sang a song, Whose Side Are You Leaning On? No one in first service knew that song. Does anyone know whose side are you leaning on? Leaning on the Lord's side. Okay, no one knows it either, so it's only me. But it's a song that talked about leaning and where do you get your strength and your hope from, and it should be on the Lord's side. One of the issues, though, as we go through life, we are bombarded with different ideas from our culture about who is God, what is God like, what does God expect from us, and very often those messages are incorrect. I mean, they're very different than what is presented in Scripture. As we begin this message, I'm going to be talking from um, and reading from Acts 19. And here Paul is running, he runs upon 12 men who they have started a journey, but they didn't have a lot of knowledge, and he helps them with that. It reminds me a couple years ago that we had a gentleman, I actually had a phone call from a friend at the Presbyterian Church, and his son was friends with someone out in California, in Los Angeles, who was a new Christian, and he is actually was a Muslim who converted to Christianity, and he was wanting to share his testimony, and he was new, but he was a... Uh, not a well-known celebrity, but he was involved in the, the Hollywood scene. And in fact, he was at a gas station one night and he met a young Christian boy named Justin Bieber. And Justin Bieber shared with him about his faith and explained it to him and invited him to his own personal Bible study. And this man took him up on that, and he became a Christian. So this is a case where Justin Bieber did help someone become a believer rather than a believer. <laughs> okay, a few got that. Okay. So, but I said, sure, let's hear it. He came on a Sunday night, so this um, new Christian man came to share his faith. And it was really interesting about his thought process and what he went through as he was looking at um, his life in Islam and now his newfound life and joy in Christianity. And at the end, he offered people to ask questions, and he just did a phenomenal job of explaining things. And most of us, not knowing much about Islam, didn't know... Um, really some good questions to ask, but we did our best. But one thing came to my mind that I asked. I said, when you pray now, do you feel like you're praying to the same God that you're praying to two years ago, but you just know something different about him? Or do you think you're praying to the same God? And he thought about that. And, and I think it, it really... Um, challenge some thoughts because he hasn't thought through that yet, which is fine. I mean, he was new in his faith and he was growing in that. And I'm not here doing a sermon on the answer to that. But he was on a journey and growing. And what I am wanting to do a sermon on is who do you worship? And are you worshiping the God that we have introduced to us through Scripture? Are you worshiping something made up just from our culture? or something maybe that you've made up on your own? And I think it's a really important question to ask because we can slide into something different if we're not careful. Now, when we begin our faith, we have to have a starting point. And when we have that starting point, what I want us to become clear on, that, that at least in my understanding, is that when we have that starting point, it's the beginning of a journey. When we begin to put our faith, hope, and trust in Jesus through our obedience to Jesus' teachings and putting our life and entrusting it in him, then it's the beginning of a journey. I think very often we make the mistake of thinking that's the end of our journey. Okay, I've done that. I'm baptized. I'm good for the rest of my life. I'm good. But that's leaving out the, the huge blessing of an understanding of actually having the experience to walk with God throughout the rest of our life in a close relationship where we're continually growing, being challenged by the Holy Spirit. And so I just want us to really think on that this morning. In my scripture passage, I want to look at Acts 19, 1 through 7. While Apollos was in Corinth, 
Paul took the road through the interior and arrived in Ephesus, and there he found some disciples, and he asked them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They answered, no, we've not even heard of the Holy Spirit. So Paul asked, then what baptism did you receive? John's baptism, they replied. Paul said, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance. He told the people to believe in the one coming after him, that is in Jesus. And on hearing this, they were baptized in the name of Lord Jesus. Then Paul placed his hands on them, and the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied, and there were about 12 men in all. So here we have a little example of Paul as he's on his missionary journey. He, he comes to Ephesus. And Ephesus, you, you may or may not remember, Ephesus is a, a really booming place during this time period. Ephesus, you might call it like the New, New York of the time period. It was on a port on what is now modern-day Turkey. So it's on a port on the Mediterranean. And Ephesus... Um, died eventually a few hundred years after this for various reasons one there's a the river put so much silt into the area they lost their harbor and then they had a big earthquake and so it had a lot of natural disasters that happened so it's not what it what it was but at the time this was the end place to be lots of traffic people from all over the world and this is a great place to start a church so as paul is there and he meets these 12 these 12 from what we see, they had a start. And they had a start of understanding John's baptism, which is a baptism of repentance, meaning that we need to understand that we cannot do this on our own, that we are sinful people, we have sinful hearts, and we need help from Jesus in overcoming that. And so they had this start, but they didn't know much. You see, we're so blessed these days that we've got God's word on paper we can have it on our phone yes it is turned off so we have it on our phone we have it on our laptops or on our desktop computers we have accessibility to printed god's word in so many ways it's just really cool and really amazing that we have that these guys did not have that um, the new testament was still early in process of being put together and being written um, and far from being printed. But I want to point out something that you may or may not have thought about. is because the way that we have access to the scriptures today, very often we develop, I think, a concept that our relationship with God is something that's strictly me and God. Because as we come together, we, we pray alone often to God we read scripture alone because we have access it to direct access to it but it wasn't always that way in fact until the printing press was invented paper was too expensive creating copies of things was too expensive for a person to own things groups of people had to own things and so the the bibles and the scriptures for a millennium before that was something that was housed in a house of worship where then for you to hear God's word, you needed to go to a place where people are all listening together and it's read and everyone absorbs, learns, and grows from hearing God's word read as a group of people, not as a solitary person just reading on their own. So for some of us, that may be kind of a, a wow thing to understand that for, for scripture, for millennium, was something that you did with other people, not just being alone. And the really cool thing about that is that as scripture is read, and as the Holy Spirit speaks to each of us as an individual and as a group, we can help each other to grow through that process of scripture being done. And so I want to challenge us um, and myself to recognize the importance of the group nature of our faith in God. And I think very often we easily understand it's the one-on-one -on -one part, and that is important that we read and we pray alone, but it's also very, very important that we gather as a group to do it as well and to hear God's word from other people's perspective. When we don't, we're very vulnerable 
to all these other sources of coming into our life and incorrectly teaching us about who God is and the nature of God and who we're called to be as followers of God. And in fact, there are a group of researchers and they were originally from Princeton, but this a book came out almost 15 years ago called Soul Searching, where they put their evidence that they put together from their research. But what they found was the majority of especially young people, but now they say that it's grown into really our entire population, that they have developed, that we have developed a new religion in our country that is, that is called Christianity, but it's very contrary to what's presented in the scriptures. And this, this new religion has three main parts to it. And the first part is that the holy God of the universe exists to make me happy. And we laugh and we chuckle about that, but that's the first tenet of the religion is that, that God exists to make me happy. And so God is, is there and, and exists and yes, created the world and, and all that we see, but the reason he exists is to make me happy. Now, another tenet of this is that God wants me to do good. And as long as my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds, then I'm good to go. And so this is a moral aspect of God that looks at for that individual who is practicing this, who they said their research says it's the majority of the people in the United States who say that they're Christian, that they're good if their good deeds outweigh their bad deeds and that they are, and they have an understanding that God exists to make me happy. That's incredible. But then I look at my own self and I think, have I been allowing this to creep into my own life? When I experience and understand my own sin, do I write it off and think, well, I've done a lot of other good things too, and it's really not that bad, you know, what I do that's wrong. It's, you know, I could do a lot worse things, and there's other people out there who do a lot worse than me. And so it's a huge temptation to be able to, to think we can write off um, the things that we do that are sin as something that's okay because I have all these other good things that I do and that bad that I do isn't really that bad. Um, which goes against the total thing of what Jesus did on the cross for us. That if we really understand what Jesus did, any sin that we have is horrible and puts a barrier between us and God in that relationship. But what, what Jesus did on the cross opens up this doorway of connecting so that when we face judgment one day, if we're putting our faith and trust and hope in Jesus, all that is seen on judgment day is the perfection of Jesus. And our sin is not there. It is wiped away as far as the east is from the west. I would much rather have that than have my good deeds outweigh my bad deeds because I don't know if that would work for me. So be careful. Don't let that creep into your life that as long as your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds, that you're okay. And the, the other one I mentioned that, that God exists to make us happy. Um, you know who that reminds me of? Santa Claus. You know, Santa Claus exists to bring presents and toys to us and, and only good things. Do we think of God a lot that way? That God exists just to make us happy? The third primary issue that this group of researchers said about this false religion is that God is quite content just waiting a long ways away from us, waiting for us to call on him to come do something for us. And that would be called deism. But God is, is very distant and is quite content 
to just sit back and relax until we need something and then to jump up and then intervene in our lives. So in this religion, there's no ongoing relationship between us and the Holy Spirit speaking to us, convicting us to, to move on and to do more. It's just not there. So again, these three things to look out for. One is looking at that in this false religion is that our good needs need to outweigh our bad deeds, that God just wants us to be moral. One, that God wants us to be happy, and that's God's primary concern. And then thirdly, that God is very distant until we need him, and then he'll come running. If someone has this as their religion, and they call it Christianity, think about all the weaknesses to that. And what happens, they found, is that whenever difficult times come in life, and the problems that a person is facing don't go away, then they give up on this religion and, and say, I don't believe in God anymore. When the truth of the matter is, the God that they were worshiping isn't the God that's presented in Scripture. It's very different. When we look at the God that Paul is preaching and following, just think what Paul went through. He went through stonings, um, whippings with a whip, imprisonment. He went through horrible things with a sense of courage and direction as he felt called to proclaim the love of Jesus throughout the Roman Empire and bringing it to the, the non-believing um, Jewish folk, to the Gentiles. And with that passion that he had as he went forth doing that, he did so with great trial and tribulation. If you asked him, are you happy? What do you think he would say? He would say, life is tough sometimes, but I am full of joy. I am so happy to be doing what God has called me to be doing. So for us, where are you at on your journey? Whose side are you leaning on? I was privileged just a few weeks ago, someone contacted me on Facebook, and it's a local couple, and they have a little baby. And he said, hey, I was planning on coming to your Bible study tonight. And through conversation on Facebook, saw that he, was, he and his wife were planning on going to China soon. And they felt this calling from God to go to a part of China where there is no Christianity. In fact, it's a section of southeast China, just up from Vietnam, the Vietnam border, where when Hudson Taylor and other missionaries went a long time ago, they never went to this section. And they are no known churches in this section of China whatsoever. And this couple felt like God was calling them to go there. And in fact, had been preparing them for a long time. The, the wife, who is from the East Coast, said that she felt when she was 12 years old, that she was listening to a missionary from Africa or somewhere talking, and she felt this overwhelming presence that God wanted her to go to China one day at 12 years old. And it was so prominent and clear to her that even in her high school, she was able to take Mandarin Chinese and start learning that and preparing for one day going, not knowing exactly what that would look like and how that would happen. And then she was at church camp actually in Dillsboro, Indiana, and met a young man who eventually also felt led independently to go to China as well. And they were married, and they've had some training. They went to Beijing um, a few years ago and learning more of Chinese culture and, and things and working with the missionary there, who while they were there, the Chinese government found out about this missionary and sent him home. Um, and they eventually came back and raised support. And I asked them, now, so what mission agency are you working through? And they're, they're like, none. There's no mission agency at all that goes to this area of China. And we're just doing it all completely independently. And I'm like, wow. And I'm like, that would scare me, honestly. And I said, so how does this work? You're just going to get off a plane and, and be, you know, no one's meeting you at the airport and you're just starting from scratch. And they're like, yeah. They said, we, we do. Here's, he said, we've prepped ahead and that we are friends in Beijing who know the language better than us um, are looking for us for a house to rent online. And so they will be, um, they'll have a, a place to stay. And then he is going to take Mandarin at a, a local university 
and to learn that. And that's their plans. And I'm like, wow, that would be, how's Kelly? Okay. <laughs> you don't have to. We can, what, you can take care of Kelly. Okay. So I'm like, wow. So they're raising support, and whenever that's finished, they're heading off to, to China. That's the same mindset as Paul. It's not a mindset of looking at what makes me most comfortable, um, what can God do to help me on my journey as I have my family and career, but God, I'm wide open. Where are you calling me to go and what to do? And that is just so cool to see when people do that. And I, I'm just amazed at that. Well, I want to challenge all of us that often we don't see that. And especially from our culture, we don't see that and understand that. Um, and very often our culture teaches us about the religion that I just mentioned. So as you live out your walk, how can you make sure that you don't let this false information about who God is or this false ins information about what Christianity is, how can you keep that from invading your thought process and who you are? And for me, my understanding is that we keep ourselves understanding of who God is by together meeting with other people and using God's word and letting it speak to us not only as individuals but as a group and for my own life I have found the most that I have learned in my life because I read scripture by myself and I also do it in a group and I fell in love with meeting with other people in a group reading scripture when I was in college actually so my sophomore year, my roommate started leading a Bible study in my room, and it was just cool, meeting with other guys on the floor, and we would read God's Word, and we were from, you know, all over the United States, and we, we brought what we had. And it wasn't so much the teacher and what the teacher was teaching, but each of us, as we were sharing how the Word was impacting who we were, and we shared that together, really made an impact on who I was and my understanding of Scripture. And remember what I said earlier, that until the last few hundred years, Scripture was always a thing that groups of people did together because of not having access like we do today. So this is a new thing of where we have something on paper or on electronic medium to, to read. So my challenge for all of us and for you is are you connecting in that way to God's Word? Because here's, here's the truth of the matter, is that if you're only reading your scripture alone, that's awesome, but you're missing out on the, the group of things of, of reading it together. We in our church family have many different ways to help you connect with reading God's word as a group. And you may think, well, when I read god's word and the holy spirit's to me and i learn from that and you do and that's awesome but when you're not connected in a group then that group is missing out on your input that you could give to the group and also you're missing out on the input the rest of the people in that group can give with you and it's an amazing thing when followers of christ come together and discuss his word and it's very powerful, and it's real, and it's transforming. And I just want to say to you, please look up online under the groups button. We have many that you can pick from. And I know it's been really hard during COVID to be able to do that. But we see the light at the end of the tunnel of coming with this. And I really want you to, to begin really thinking deeply, if you're not involved now, to consider doing that. Sunday morning, there's several during the Sunday school time. Um, there's throughout the weeknights and on Sunday night, there's groups that you can connect with. Eric's got one on Tuesday night. It's awesome. The Whites have one on Monday night. I've got one on Wednesday night. Um, but look online. There's a place where you can connect 
and you can hear God's Spirit speaking through His Word, through other people, and then you can give input into that as well. And for me, that's where I have found my best opportunity for clarity on who God is and who God is calling me to be and helping me to understand that the world is teaching me a different view of who God is. And we have to have the input of other people through God's word to really, I think, clarify things. And your input is very needed within these groups. We have a few questions to look up that Zandria is popping up. How do you know that you're worshiping the correct version of God? Think about that. How do you know? How do you get the answer to that? It is so tempting as well, not only to pick up what our culture is telling us, but it's so easy just to make up God in our own image of who we want God to be and then make that version of God easy, put God in a little box. Um, How do you know that you're worshiping the correct version of God? What steps are you taking to introduce other folks to the God of the Bible? For us to truly be who God is calling us to be, and it involves sharing the good news. We're all called in the Great Commission to share God with other people. Do you find that really difficult? I do sometimes. Where are you at in that process of, of being able to communicate that to others? As Eric plays a little bit, just listen to the Holy Spirit speak to you. What is your next step that you need to take to be more of who God is calling you to be? What is that step looking like? Just be open and your spirit really open to be who God is calling you to be. God, as we open our hearts to you this morning, help us to be digging in to see who You really are. Help us to transform our thinking to recognize who you are for who you are in truth and not something that we make up or our culture has made up. God, just speak to us and may we have the courage to do and be what you call us to be and do. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's all stand. How do I say thank you, Lord, for the way that you love 
in the way that you come for all that you've done and all that you'll do my heart pours out thank you and you don't have to come but you always do and you show up in splendor and change the whole room you don't have to come but you always do up in splendor and change the whole room. How do I say thank you, Lord, for the life that you And the cross that you bore for the love you poured out to ransom my soul. My heart pours out this thankful song. You don't have to come. show up in splendor and change the whole room you don't have to come but you always do and you show up in splendor and change the whole Holy God, may we listen to your Spirit speaking to us. And may we, we, may we be willing with courage to take that next step that we need to take. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen.